Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I am um, going to take one second just to take a deep breath. Everyone take a deep breath. Um, and uh, it is my pleasure now to uh, move us into this a panel, this next panel discussion. We have a great group of panelists we can all process together. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and again, this is about answering the call, serve, 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 but also talking about some of the challenges that Peace Corps uh, and other, um, other public service uh, organizations are having too. So it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Nicole Bannister. Nicole is a TV host, presenter, and international change maker. She splits her time across Los Angeles, California, and uh, Cape Town, South Africa. She's the host of the celebrity interview series, Nikki Bonds Live, every Tuesday on IGTV, as well as uh, started up the YouTube series showcasing one of the world's most prestigious social entrepreneurship competitions. Nikki has hosted conferences, panels, and events in 25 different countries. Nikki, N Nicole, I'm sorry, Nikki, Nicole is also the winner of the Peace Corps 2023 Franklin H. Williams Emerging Leaders Award. And she is also a United Nations Alliance of Civil Civilizations Fellow. And while serving in the Peace Corps in Lim Limpopo, South Africa, Nicole ran after school exercise classes and taught her students about building healthy relationships. Nicole, welcome. Thank you so much, Sandy. It's an honor to be here. Uh, Alana De Joseph. Alana De Joseph was an enterprise development advisor in a small town in uh, Mali, West Africa, in Peace Corps. Uh, Alana has worked in video and film production for more than 40 years. She began her career as a 10 year old actress. So since then, uh, she has won many, uh, worn many hats as a producer, director, videographer, and editor. But her heart has always been in documentaries. And between 2000, 2003 and 2013, she was associate producer of the PBS documentaries, The Greatest Good about the US Forest Service and Green Fire about conservationist Aldo Le Leopold. In 2013, Alana began working on the first featured documentary about the history of Peace Corps. That's amazing, the first one, A Towering Task. On September 22nd, uh, 2019, the film premiered to a full house at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. And in December 2020, she won the Best Director Award in the Feature Documentary category at the Indo Global International Film Festival in Mumbai. And starting this month, A Towering Task is airing on PBS stations across the country. Alana, welcome. Sorry, I was muted. And <laughs> thank you so much for having me. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and then now we have Andrew Wilson. Andrew is currently the director of the Office of Third Goal and Return Volunteer Services at the Peace Corps. Uh, Andrew has been serving in this role since May 2020. Uh, before coming to the Peace Corps, he served as the director of digital engagement at the National Archives. Andrew also has worked at the Department of Health and Human Services in the Department of Agriculture, where he managed web and social media operations. Andrew was a sustainable agriculture volunteer in Senegal from 1994 to 1996 and served as a volunteer leader for the Northern region of Senegal in 1997. Andrew, welcome. Uh, thank you, Sandy. And boy, it's not fair showing those stories before. No. I, 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 I'm still trying to recover over here, but, but, but thanks. To well, you. if it makes you feel better, so am I. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about that programming. Maybe I could have tweaked that a little bit, but, but thank you, Andrew. Uh, well, listen, I, let's, let's, uh, we're going to be in conversation today. Uh, you know, we're going to keep it real. Uh, but, but, you know, let's just start with, uh, you know, taking, taking yourselves back to your young selves when you, you joined Peace Corps. And why don't you share uh, why and what that moment was like, uh, you know, back in the day when, when you decided to join Peace Corps. I'm, Let's see who's not crying. Let's let's let's. I think we're all crying. We'll start with you, Nicole. I'm definitely crying. Okay, I'm definitely crying. Um, <laughs> just first off, thank you so much to everybody who's here. It's such an honor to be in conversation with you, Sandy and Andrew and Alana, some people who I absolutely admire so much in Peace Corps, and to everyone who's here, welcome. Um, as I reflect on a on a young Nicole Bannister. Um, 
It was actually 10 years ago this year that I started my Peace Corps service. I'm celebrating the 10 year anniversary of service, which is something that's just been so special. And it's been so beautiful to see how Peace Corps has come back into my life in 2023 in particular. Um, I actually left for Peace Corps South Africa on the 4th of July. 2013. So I oftentimes call it my independence from America Day because here I am in South Africa. 10 years later, I just came here for Peace Corps and just never left. Um, but when I when I literally reflect on sort of what I was thinking in that moment, you know, I was uh, studying at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. I was studying in the School of Foreign Service, studying culture and politics, and I really wanted to do something at the intersection of my two passions, which were international travel and social impact. I had traveled a lot previously. I was so blessed to have a family that moved around a lot. So we lived in Singapore, we lived in Bolivia, we had these international adventures. So living overseas wasn't something new to me. It was something that I was so excited about. It was an integral part of my life at that point. So the opportunity to be able to live and work full-time overseas and to do it um, with an organization like Peace Corps that was so rooted in having an impact on the world and having this deeper understanding of cross-cultural capital was something that was, was really critical to me and pushed out all the other organizations I was looking at, like Teach for America, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so as I reflect on that younger version of me, being able to work at those intersections was, was critical and it's the thing that keeps me in those two spaces to this day. Well, and and, and you're still living in South Africa. Yes, coming to you live from Cape Town right now. <laughs> she never came back. There you go. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Andrew, what, what's your origin story with Peace Corps? Sure, happy to share. Uh, and, for, and first of all, uh, Nikki, your enthusiasm and your commitment to uplifting <laughs> voices from around the world is inspiring. Alana, I've learned so much about the Peace Corps from, from all your work. And so thank you for your tireless um, promotion of the Peace Corps and, and explaining that to the world. And certainly thank you to, to Dan, all the folks at NPCA and the staff and all the members here today. It's amazing to see you and all that you've done uh, uh, around the world uh, for part of Peace Corps and, and continuing to do around the world and here in the United States. So uh, my journey, so I started, uh, I got I got the opportunity. I'd never traveled really abroad uh, up until, uh, you know, after college. I had the opportunity to travel a bit. Um, I eventually ended up uh, after about three months uh, working and living on a farm in Israel and, and living and working with a number of international people from around the world. And the, the trip was inspiring. It was amazing. Um, but I, I, I felt in many ways unsatisfied and sometimes even uncomfortable with the fact that I kept going through these different cultures and I wasn't having the opportunity to make relationships with people. Mm -hmm. And I was collecting experiences. I was collecting things and seeing things, but I wasn't meeting and interacting with people. And I just really felt deeply unsatisfied with that. And so um, I knew about the Peace Corps and I heard about it before. My, my mother had actually had applied um, for medical reasons. She didn't clear, but it was in my consciousness. And, and, I, and I applied and I was able to go to Senegal. And, you know, that deep uh, desire for making connections, it happened, right? Like I, I had those amazing connections. Um, Eventually, you know, I married a woman from Senegal. I have tremendous connections back to that country now. Um, my my uh, my older daughter is actually named after the the sort of my host mo family mother back in back in my little village. And just this year, after many many years, got uh, back in touch with my own village. And when they were so happy to hear about, they call her, they call my older daughter their mother now because they have the same name. And it's such an inspiring story. Uh, and, and really is so proud to make those connections. But the but the one piece that I do want to highlight here real quickly is um, I, I I had the opportunity to think about Peace Corps and think about it as an option because I heard about it before. And so many people don't hear about it. And that's such an important part of the storytelling is making sure that everybody around the country and people from every age and every community hear about the Peace Corps. And so for me, I was lucky that I'd heard it, but, but part of the storytelling is the, really the importance of everybody hearing about it. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we're going to get to that. You know, we're going to dig into that a little bit. Uh, six degrees of separation because Nicole, my daughter, was born in South Africa and Durban. And this wall hanging behind me is from Senegal. So I'm, I'm feeling very connected to you all in so many different ways right now. Alana, what about you? I love this question because, of course, I asked that question so many times when we were producing a towering task. With always the first question of why did you join the Peace Corps? And um, I think there's a commonality in many ways um, to that origin story, as you called it, for, for us when we joined the Peace Corps. And I see it kind of as this continuum between self and service. 
And um, I'd love to say that I joined because I wanted to be of service and I had this notion of, you know, being supportive to the world or whatever. But there are many selfish reasons why I joined. And I think that's probably true for a lot of Peace Corps volunteers. Um, I like the notion of going somewhere completely different, somewhere that I had no experience about, no no understanding of. And I felt that was a big gap in my, in my knowledge. I was in a college class in my business school program that was called Food Population and Poverty. And I learned about um, various African countries and I had never been to the continent and it sounded amazing and interesting and and fascinating and and a little bit of me thought well maybe I can be helpful because you know when you come out of college with your liberal arts degree and I had a theater degree I did have a business degree but I had mainly a theater degree and um I I felt pretty much like a you know fish out of water not not I couldn't see how I could be useful to the world very well and and here was Peace Corps that was offering me a possibility to not only broaden myself, but then somehow be useful. And that was to me the, the the service component. And I think the service component for me started growing once I hit the ground in Mali, once I got there as a Peace Corps volunteer and I got to meet the people who I was supposed to be useful for. And then the difficult questions started. That's that's when the questions start with how do I do more good than harm? And, and how do I tread lightly and yet do something meaningful? Um, but uh, I, th I think there's a lot of echoes in when you ask volunteers, return volunteers about why they joined the Peace Corps. And we start, many of us start with more selfish reasons and we end with more service re uh, reasons. And then being able to tell that story about the service part is where the challenge, com challenge comes in for all of us, I think. Wow, well, we're gonna talk about your life coming full circle too from that beginning to actually doing this uh, this amazing uh, film. By the way, many Peace Corps volunteers uh, have uh, done StoryCorps um, conversations to really document and uh, their experiences um, uh, through our app. And one of the the uh, interviews I, I listened to recently, the volunteer said, and it's what you were saying, it's, it's the most uh, uh, selfish, selfless thing you can do, right? And you can probably fix flip that also and talk about it's the most self, self selfless selfish thing you can do too so depending on how you look at it um you know andrew you uh you talked about uh you know storytelling and people not knowing um enough about uh peace corps and and the, the, interestingly all of us all of you on the panel including myself uh, storytelling is is really kind of the heart of of, of what we do uh, so andrew you know let's 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 talk about how you're doing StoryCorps um, and, and talk a little bit more about Third Goal too. Sure, uh, happy to tell more about storytelling. Yeah, I have the tremendous good fortune to be involved in, in storytelling at the Peace Corps and, and everybody knows there are such amazing, amazing stories. Uh, and there's some really important components to it. And, and the way I think about storytelling and, and, and how that's evolving at the Peace Corps, um, it's sort of three ways. It's, it's first, um, thinking about who gets to tell the story about the Peace Corps. And, you know, in a lot of ways, historically, it's been volunteers in the field or returning volunteers telling the story. But increasingly, how can we be inclusive of host country national voices? And that could be staff, that can be community members, it can be counterparts. But how can how can we possibly be telling the story of these other countries without those voices? And it doesn't mean replacing the voices of volunteers or return volunteers. That's part of the story as well but adding those really rich, incredible stories and voices of host country nationals. And we try and do that in so many different ways. Uh, Director Spahn yesterday talked about the fact that we have, uh, I think about 14 host country national staff members currently here in the United States, uh, helping participate in recruitment activities. We did an event last September at the Kennedy Center with four host country nationals telling their own stories and the importance of uh, their own voices sharing those stories. And that really struck me in, the, in the, what you shared at the beginning is, is hearing those voices of is those individuals and empowering them, them to tell their own stories. The second piece of, of thinking about uh, storytelling is, is how we tell our stories when it is a volunteer or return volunteer. It's making sure that we do it ethically, intentionally. Um, and one of the things that we put out as an organization last year, in part uh, as a result of some of the conversations I, at, at events such as this was an ethical storytelling toolkit and really help folks reflect on that. And then the last piece is who gets to hear the stories, which I mentioned before, is making sure that we are so intentional about getting to underserved communities and getting to places where we never have before as part of the Peace Corps community. So when I think of storytelling at the Peace Corps and, and some changes, it's who gets to tell the story, it's how that story is told, and then who gets to hear that story here and around the world. 
Well, I have to ask you about ethical storytelling. Can you can you fill that out a little bit more for us? Sure. It, it's really about it's it, you know it's about the intentionality and, and sort of reflecting on the stories that you tell and and sort of how you tell them. It's thinking about the power dynamics when you're the individual telling the story about another country. It's thinking about the biases that you might have that you're not even aware of, and it's taking the time to sort of step back and think about those stories. I know for myself, for example, there's certain stories that maybe when I first came back that you know. I know it would get a laugh or would get some shock value, but really now it's like, what is, what, why was I telling you that story in that way? And who, who was impacted or who, would, how would people think about that story if they heard it? And in the ethical storytelling toolkit, they talk about, we talk about the golden rule and sort of the platinum rule and the golden rule, which everybody knows of, it's, it's a version of this. Um, it's what, how would that person that you're telling the story about feel if they were there when you were telling that story? The platinum rule is really about how would how would that person feel if their friends and family members and community members were in that room while you were telling that story? And that and that is so important when you're doing your tell, storytelling is not just be automatic about it, be intentional, reflect on it, be introspective about it and really make sure that you're you're doing. You know, there's always going to be room for improvement and always more room to get better about how you do it. But be intentional about your storytelling. Thank you, Andrew. You know, one of the things that StoryCorps that's really important to us is do no harm. And uh, and these stories that you just saw, uh, which are edited down in in from these 40 minute interviews, we run them by the participants every single time uh, to make sure we're telling their story right and uh, to make sure that, you know, our own biases are not coming in things. So I appreciate, um, you know, that perspective. Alana, you did that big film and which I cannot wait to see. Um, tell 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 us a little bit more about sort of what you discovered in in doing this film, and um, you know what what you discovered from Peace Corps volunteers. Well, I think sticking with the theme of storytelling, um, it, it's it was very challenging because as Peace Corps volunteers, we either have the tendency to go for the easy laugh, you know, the shock value of the latrine stories or whatever or we it, the further we get away from our experience the more nostalgic we become of it uh, about our experience and the more it has these overtones as the kumbaya sandy as you called it earlier too is, is this idealized notion and we get away from the real story and it becomes harder and harder for other people to relate to us because our stories don't really connect on on some nitty-gritty level um so when we interviewed people, and we interviewed over 200 people for a towering task, not everybody made it into the documentary, but uh, it was a lot of interviews. I felt like the first 20 minutes of every interview were getting past the kumbaya, was the, the okay, let's all agree that we love the Peace Corps. Let's all agree that, you know, we can slap each other on the back and congratulate each other about how wonderful it is. But that's not what we're here to talk about. Let's talk about what's really happening on the ground. Let's talk about why it matters. And because, of course, our documentary was a history documentary, let's talk about your moment in time and how your moment in time as a Peace Corps volunteer was different from what might have happened in the 60s or what might be happening right now for Peace Corps volunteers. Um, and then we found the same thing really with host country nationals, Andrew, because we it was very important for us that we didn't have just this myopic, purely American lens on the story of the Peace Corps, but that we would have um, the, the voices on the ground that could attest to whether whether it was really helpful for Peace Corps volunteers to be there or not. Um, and we had that same challenge because nobody wanted to say anything bad about the Peace Corps. And so my first, my, my first words in all these interviews usually was, okay, let's assume all of this <laughs> and put that aside and now tell us the real story now uh, what what are some of the things that are important how are you seeing this from the host country national perspective versus what volunteers might be experiencing and and even with all of that you'd still in the documentary you, you see we have Irina Krupska who's talking about Ukraine and she's just bubbling over with excitement that she can make other people as excited about Ukraine as she is about her home country and um and um, Sam Sampson in Liberia was talking about um, um, how he was going to plug these volunteers into the holes where they where, where they were needed, and in math teachers, and and our the future of Liberia is here, and this is what we gonna, are going to do with this pool of volunteers. Um, so it was challenging to get to the meat of the story, um, but once people were all on the same 
common denominator of, okay, we understand I don't have to defend the Peace Corps. I don't have to somehow glorify the Peace Corps. I can just talk about my experience. Then the real stuff came out and that was really, really powerful, I thought. And what would you define as the real stuff? Hmm, good question. Um, big variations. So from the 60s to current day, so many so many differences in what the Peace Corps was like. You know, the, the early 60s, you had a mostly male dominated, mostly white, mostly Ivy League college uh, population that was joining the Peace Corps. Um, and so the story was was not tainted, but but was affected by that. So when we interviewed um, Juana Bordas, uh, who was a, um, Hispan a Latina woman, um, she was talking about being from an immigrant family and being surrounded by all these white guys um, when she was joining the Peace Corps. And then you get all the way to to you know current day. It was somewhere in the in the late seventies, early eighties. I think that it uh, that it flipped from mostly male to mostly female um, volunteers, and and then you had suddenly the the, the males were kind of feeling a little isolated with all the female volunteers around them um but you'd have you'd have really good stories um about about well when i was a volunteer during the 80s and um and every all, all my friends in the states were looking for their next hedge fund manager job or um distraction um commercialism and whatnot. And I felt like I needed to do something meaningful, like setting yourself apart, but at the same time, seeing as yourself as part of the history that you are in just really made the story so much more interesting. And, and I, I, I think that was when, when the real stuff came out, when, um, well, even Reed Hastings, who, who, um, gave us a very short interview, but, um, uh, you know, and, and was a busy man with his mind all over the place. Thing. Well, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Reagan era, and uh, there was a lot of international engagement, subtext, subtext, subtext. Um, mm -hmm. So it was just very fascinating. But yeah, the, the real stuff had lots of variations depending on where you were in Peace Corps history. Well, I remember. Thank you, Alana. Where when uh, you know there was a small group of Black volunteers in my group, and we were all excited to go to the motherland, right? Thinking that that was going to suddenly we were going to arrive and. You know, we we would, um, you know, feel differently. And then when we were, you know, put at the back of the line in the bank every single time behind every white person, it sort of was an awakening for us. And it was a real awakening for me that the entire time I was in Africa, uh, whether in West Africa, I was uh, red in in Southern Africa, I was I was yellow or white. I mean, there was never a black in there. Right. So there were all these kind of things that that also were <laughs> Nikki, you're laughing at that. Uh, so we get to move to you, uh, Nicole. I don't know why I keep calling you Nikki, Nicole. Um, uh, you know, I'm so fascinated uh, by you, um, uh, you know, sort of going from international development to entertainment and storytelling. Talk about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and for the record, you can call me Nicole or Nikki. It's all good. <laughs> you know, for me, I spent the first decade of my career in international development. It started with Peace Corps and then moved on to working with big INGOs and being a United Nations fellow and speaking at the UN headquarters in New York City. Um, and again, this theme of social impact, which is so critical in my life. Um, but if we, yeah, if I reflect on on storytelling, um, I love what Andrew said so poignantly about you know how we we tell those stories, and how we're so thoughtful about them, and um, and the intentionality that comes behind that. And so, looking at the international development sector for me, I started to think critically not about how we tell the stories, um, but about where we tell those stories. And that is exactly the reason why. I pivoted from international development to entertainment because for me, we weren't telling the stories in the right way or in the right place. And I know this is something that we sort of joked about on our on our prep call, but when I think about storytelling for the Peace Corps, the reality is that right now, the Peace Corps is not sexy. Okay, and when I say that the Peace Corps is not sexy, I mean, it's not a part of pop culture, it's not trending, it's not viral, and ultimately, because we're not telling the right stories in the right places, 
Peace Corps is becoming irrelevant. And that's a really scary place to be in, in a world where I feel like we are consistently competing for FaceTime, right? Um, and Peace Corps is one of the most dynamic, intersectional, and global programs that exists. It touches everyone in so many different ways, not just in the United States, but in the whole entire world, right? So we should be relevant. We should be a part of the conversation. We should be sexy. Um, you know, but but we're not. <laughs> I took this um, amazing masterclass with Roxanne Gay, who's this like incredible uh, feminist author. And um, she said that, you know, people are for bad content. And I think that Peace Corps and the stories that it's telling is bad content as someone who comes from the social media and the entertainment space. And so for me, thinking about uh, that move to entertainment, thinking about making Peace Corps sexy again, thinking about telling very sexy stories for the Peace Corps, we have to integrate Peace Corps into the media and into pop culture in a way that it currently doesn't exist. So we need to get Peace Corps into TV shows and movies. We need to get the main character of the most viral like youth show on Netflix, something like Insecure, something like Euphoria, something like Grownish, Never Have I Ever. We need to get that main character graduating from college saying, I'm going into the Peace Corps right all of a sudden millions of eyeballs are now on Peace Corps that were never on Peace Corps before we need to get Peace Corps into music how do we get a singer or a rapper to include a line in the song that's like hustling hard like I'm in the Peace Corps how do we collaborate with an artist to get a line like that in a major song on a on a Spotify playlist how do we get the Peace Corps onto YouTube right when we think about storytelling people don't watch TV the young generation doesn't watch TV they watch YouTube and they only watch YouTube right how do we get the biggest YouTubers to go to a Peace Corps volunteer site, right? Like we look at like all these travel bloggers, all these travel YouTubers. How do we get them to spend a day with a Peace Corps volunteer somewhere? How do we get an award-winning content creator to do a show on the Peace Corps? Um, or how do we get Peace Corps onto sort of the more prestigious global conferences and platforms and spaces for thought leadership? Like where are the Peace Corps op-eds in the New York Times? Where is a Peace Corps volunteer sitting on a panel at the United Nations, right? Where is Peace Corps at Davos? Where is Peace Corps at Can Lions? Where is Peace Corps at One Young World, right? We need to get Peace Corps and our stories onto different platforms. So I think we've got the how down in a good way. And I, like I said, I love what, what folks have been saying on this panel in particular around how we're telling stories from all sorts of different perspectives and angles. So we've got that down. Now what we need to change is where. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And as uh, I think Douglas Croc Crockett said, you know, how do we how do we get Peace Corps into the Barbie movie? Uh, you know, well, look, it, it, you know, there there's there's all that, right? Uh, and, and so I think as we ask this question, like, why is there a decline um, of young people, uh, you know, signing up for service? And it's not just Peace Corps. I think it's, it's, it's you know, a lot of loss of trust in institutions. It's, it's, it's it, there's so many things, right? Um, you know, going, going where they already are, uh, it really, really makes a big difference. And I think, you know, media overall in general uh, is trying to figure out, you know, how how can be relevant and resonant and connected. Alana, how how's that all sit with you in terms of what Nicole just said? Uh, because is that all, you know, is that in the towering, um, you know, task? Uh, you know, we we took a little bit of a stab at it in the towering yeah. task. We uh, pulled some clips from uh, some Hollywood movies, from volunteers, and from Airplane, and um, because Peace Corps in popular media has become a little bit shorthand for naive idealism. So the way in, when you watch a Hollywood movie and you see the young woman throwing up, you're like, ah, she's pregnant. Um, if somebody in a popular movie says, I'm joining the Peace Corps or those are Peace Corps volunteers, it's shorthand for they don't know what's going on. You know, they they are head in the cloud um, um, do-gooders. Um, and so I, I couldn't agree with Nicole more that we need it in popular media and we need it in a way that doesn't reinforce that stereotype. And, and the problem is Peace Corps, real, you know, interaction with the rest of the world is complex. It's difficult. It's a gray, muddy mess. And development is a difficult subject that has some dark stories to it. And, and so I think there's a lot of potential to have that lighthearted entertainment that is just front and center, loud in your face right there that will be wonderful to have. And at the same time, be able to get a little bit of the more complex stories out there. Um, I know the concept of service, we talked about that. And, and um, in the in the documentary, we trace history from six, you know, shortly before 61, the founding of the Peace Corps, all the way to current day. And um, 
you see this marked change in American in American culture with the Vietnam War, and it it was just this disillusionment. Before that, you had well, most of the founders from uh, of the Peace Corps were, came out of World War II. They had a very tangible, concrete concept of what war was, and so they had a very tangible, concrete concept of what peace is, and um, and at the same time, also what service was. They served in the military, and so um, then you progress in history and you get to the Vietnam War and America just becomes so disillusioned with its government. And that that cynicism about um, about how blindly or how idealistic in some ways, how cynical the government was in many ways, that hasn't really left our culture. I did. It's this giant scar that's still somehow festering in the American culture, I think. And and um, and now you get to current day. So there was no ever redeeming of, oh, now you want to use work for the American government, because now suddenly it's this, um, you know, city on a shining hill. Um, but um, now you you find yourself in a time where with these intractable problems. I have two teenagers and um, they're thinking of climate change. And my son the other day made a st statement saying that, yeah, I don't think I will live past 30. Mm. And just, just that assumption, just these dark, dark thoughts that you wouldn't assume to have in teenagers. They live, they, I, my, my little mnemonic in the head is intractable problems, distractible world. So we live in this, this culture, this generation Z is coming up with problems that they have very little control over or that is that seem very very hard for them to have meaningful impact on and then at the same time a culture of media distraction that is just shortening all of our attention spans that doesn't that keeps us away from thinking more deeply um so how do we break through that how do we put meaning back in how do we make service something that is not this idealist kumbaya notion but that acknowledges the fact of how messy things are and how difficult things are and that become sexy that that the concept then becomes sexy in a way because we're not we're not we're not selling people something I you know when we did the documentary about the Peace Corps it was very important that the documentary was independent from the agency PBS wouldn't show it if it was otherwise of course not because the agency was in any way unfriendly to the documentary but so that we could tell the whole story warts and all because if we put out a PR piece that was a glorified recruitment video. The audience knows, people know when they're being sold something. And so when we tell this story about, oh, Peace Corps is all um, unicorns and rainbows, then people tune out after the first couple of seconds of the story. Yeah, yeah. And you only have a few seconds in today's media age to really, you know, grab someone's attention. You know, Andrew, you know, we talked about uh, uh, this a little bit um, yesterday, but you know, the white savior uh, sort of storyline uh, has, you know, had been very dominant in Peace Corps. And I mean, everything's about visuals too. And so uh, has Peace Corps shed that? Uh, uh, or is that still something that you think about uh, that's still a challenge in, in what you're doing? Well, I think, well, first of all, I agree with, I mean, so many of the things that Nicole said uh, initially, and, and 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 I see a lot of votes for Nicole for being the sexy, the, the sexy spokesperson. We accomplished for, something. If Corps. nothing else, we got a new uh, Peace Corps spokesperson. There we go. Um, I mean, the, th the fact that you bring it up means that it's not entirely shed, right? Like, I think that's that's the honest truth. Um, um, but the reality is, um you know, there are so many different ways um, that I think we can we can I, I think counteract that argument. Um, again, when we think about the storytelling, it's a, it's sort of the ways we talk about the Peace Corps. It's about the work that we do, um, and and just incredibly important to um, continue to show that that the Peace Corps is you know relevant. It's changing. It's evolving, and and it really is something that is is needed more in the world today than ever before. I mean, Alana talked about these intractable challenges, right? Sort of the biggest things that we have going on in the world today, they are climate change affects the entire world. The, the pandemic that we just lived through or are still living through, you think about immigration and all these major issues, these are global, global challenges. And it's gonna take individuals that have the ability to work across cultures, work with people, build relationships, build community to solve these problems. And I think there's so much that the Peace Corps has to offer, so much so much that return volunteers, that volunteers have to offer, that really, uh, I think telling that story about how we're part of the solution to these global challenges is, is incredibly important. Well, I think it's interesting, the specialization <clears throat> that also is happening within Peace Corps. So Lana, as you're talking about, you know, your kid who's really interested in climate change, 
I mean, you know, there's countries also now saying we are very, very concerned and interested in climate change. And so part of the storytelling is is the sort of this resonant thing like, you know what? I mean, it, you know, so much of the story often has been about what Peace Corps is going in to do as opposed to what do the countries really want and and where their heads are uh, and, and what they're asking for. Uh, and so there's a whole thing to to be filled out. So, you know, I I I I ended my keynote with a little wisdom and and some hope and humanity. Um, you know, how about some closing thoughts from each of you uh in what and however you want to express it, whatever you want to say. Uh why don't we go to you, uh Nikki. N Nikki, Nicole. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. And I'm really going to build on what both Andrew and Alana said. And there's somebody fabulous in the chat named named Kathy, who is uh, also spitting some bars that I'm going to uh, I'm going to build on. Um, you know, we're we're talking about you know answer the call, serve, serve, serve. We're talking about this decline in interest in public service. We're talking about how would you how do we get the next generation involved in in the Peace Corps? Um, and I don't think that people are no longer interested in public service. I think that people no longer associate prestige or admiration with the word service. And when we look at the word service, right, the etymology of the word service is rooted in slavery. The earliest version of the word, the literal Latin word service, S-E-R-V-U-S, means slave. So... <laughs> With that in mind, right, Peace Corps is trying to purport this like very happy, intersectional, forward thinking narrative of the word service and the concept of service, but the concept of service is institutionally rooted in dominion over others, being at someone else's command and not having agency. Those themes are not only the antithesis of what Peace Corps is and what Peace Corps actually does, but in 2023, perpetuating a narrative of service when we know the root of the word is slavery is unacceptable. So for me, the solution is to shift the narrative of service to instead a narrative of social impact. People don't want to serve in the way that it's currently and very socioculturally understood. People want to make an impact. So let's shift the Peace Corps' entire narrative around service to instead social impact. Let's instead center diversity, cross-cultural capital, gender equality, marriage equality, uh, migration, climate change. Like, let's stop talking about Peace Corps volunteers serving and instead talk about Peace Corps volunteers addressing the biggest modern day movements happening across the globe. This is literally what Alana was speaking out. Let's talk about Peace Corps volunteers addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Time's Up, Marriage Equality, Refugees, Global Warning, the end of apartheid, right? All these things. And so for me, this is the reality of what Peace Corps volunteers do and what our host country counterparts do. They are doing those things. They are having this incredible impact and they have an impact in this tremendously global and deeply intersectional way on the biggest movements of our time. Um, so for me, when we stop rooting the work of Peace Corps in a antiquated, nostalgic, white savior idea of charity, of neocolonialism and service, we instead root the narrative of Peace Corps in global social impact. And for me, that's something that everyone wants to be a part of. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, you know, it reminds me, I think Alana, Al Al I was reading uh, one of the comments about your film, I think, and it was from Lilla Watson who said, if you've come to help, you're wasting your time. If you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us let us work together. Uh, so that's what makes me think about what you were just saying, uh, Nicole. Um, Alana. Well, and that quote, we, we started with that quote back in 2013 when we started producing the film. Um, actually, Randy Adams, who is a stalwart member of the Peace Corps community, he sent me that quote um, when we were discussing what Peace Corps should really be. And um, and that quote carried us throughout most of the production of the film. And we put a lot uh, of work through that filter in how we put the film together. But at the end of the day, uh, Lilla Watson is an Aboriginal or was an Aboriginal activist. She said this in the 80s. And um, and there was no way of tying Lilla Watson to the Peace Corps. She had no history with the Peace Corps. And I was wrestling with it because I really wanted that quote somehow or that concept somehow in the film. And it wasn't until one, one day I sat there and I just re listened over and over again to JFK's Ask Not Speech. 
And we were discussing, should we have that second part of the ask not speech in there or not? The first part is ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Everybody knows that part. But then if you leave it running, it's It kind of already says it, so that how we kept it in there, and then of course, predictably, me as a as a uh, document history documentary person, um, for me, it's about the longevity too. It's the uh, I love Nicole talking about the impact, um, the measuring the outcomes. Now, my my issue comes in. I, I love what you said about service and the and the word and the complications around it. I then have complications around the word impact. I was at a conference and this lady on the panel said, you know, we keep talking about the word impact and what is an impact really? It's a short, violent encounter. Is that what we're looking for? And so changing the vocabulary to, to outcomes, to, to measurable outcomes, to understanding what is it that the Peace Corps does. So this is the goal one part where, you know, goal two and three are very, very hard to measure. The cultural exchange is hard to measure. It's, you know, arguably the more important part of what Peace Corps does, but it's the harder one to measure. Goal one is easier to measure and we have a responsibility to the American public and to all the host country nationals um, to measure what it is that we do um, as the Peace Corps. And I think kind of having that, being able to I, I see momentum coming around that out of the Peace Corps community, out of the host countries of how do we explain what the Peace Corps does. And I think that will also get the excitement going amongst the new generation of Peace Corps volunteers because they'll be there for a reason. They won't just be there to self-actualize. They will be there because it matters. It matters to the world that we live in right now. Yeah, I see. Uh, well, Dan had posted that volunteer also is rife with certain things, right? Um, uh, so word, words really matter and, um, you know, measuring in, in, in the words that, that those we work with are actually using and, and not from sort of how we look at things, you know, uh, is, is also very important. So Andrew, you have, um, you know, the tough task is really closing us out here. Uh, what I like about this conversation, and I thank all of you for it is that it's not just a bunch of hand wringing, but it's actually moving us in a direction like here's some stuff we can do here, you know, uh, that is, is just starting with just what's, what's the low hanging stuff. So Andrew, yeah, and, and thanks to everybody. I just, again, such great uh, group of individuals to spend some time with today and, and great ideas. Um, the one thing maybe I'll add to this is that, and I saw a little bit of this in the chat, um, we've focused a little bit on sort of the stories that happen during service and what happens in those two or three years where, where volunteers are in their countries. Some of the most amazing stories, and, and, and in my role, I, I've had such a, a great luck to in, interact with so many return volunteers, are the stories of the impact of return volunteers once they come back uh, here to the United States or work elsewhere around the world. And just the amazing careers. I mean, I, I remember uh, last night uh, hearing somebody talk about the, an anthology of a thousand stories of, I think, Liberian volunteers and, and just said, you know, here's where they were a volunteer and here's what that this amazing career they've gone on today. Um, and I think about that all the time. And, and that's such a powerful story, particularly, you know, when individuals, there's so many different opportunities for individuals to have some kind of, Im Im I'll say, impact in the world right now. Um, and we saw like Give Pulse, but there's many, many different ways for folks to do that. Um, but one of the challenges is the economic realities that many individuals have today and to be able to take, in their mind, take time off to then uh, out of their career uh, to go two or three years and then and the, and the concerns of, and the concerns of their families about doing that. The reality is Peace Corps is a step and an amazing step into an amazing network of individuals, amazing careers and really telling that story about what happens after the fact. I think that is so, so important for us. And I'll just give one, one very quick example. Uh, earlier this year, uh, we did an event at uh, Bennett College, which is one of two all-women HBCUs uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. And there was a woman on the panel, uh, it was a gender equity panel, and her, her name is, uh, I believe she was a RPCB from uh, Paraguay, a woman named Besson Obinson. And she uh, works for in Guatemala for UNHCR. And she talked about, the impact on not just her life, uh, but the life for, of her son and talked about generational impact and what the fact that he speak, he's 16, he speaks four different languages, he's been all around the world and how it's changing the trajectory of her entire family because of this experience. And that is one of the narratives that we just, we I don't think we tell enough and we're so focused on the, the experience in the country that we don't tell that larger picture to our own sort of deficit. So 
Uh, so that's a call to action to everybody here. All the RPCBs here is to tell your stories about what you've done. Again, what you did in service, but also what you've done afterwards. So I'll close with that. Well, thank you, Nicole, Andrew, Alana. We kept it real, just as we said we would. Um, it, it's the beginning of also a relationship uh, for all of us. And so it's great to be connected. And thanks to everyone in the chat. Like somebody make sure you copy this chat because there's some amazing um, comments and ideas in the chat. So once again, what a great opportunity to be here. Great to be connected with you all. And um, thank you all for the time uh, in joining this panel today.